Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 29th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we ask, what does it mean exactly for Republicans to, quote, take back the House, close quote. Second, we explain why the governor's race is far from the cakewalk some currently are predicting. And third, we ask how exactly Alaska is supposed to pay for itself in the state's next economy some are touting. And now, let's join Michael. So, Brad, let's dive right into it because I ran a little long. I apologize. I hate cutting into your time. Let's talk uh, about number one, which probably folds into what I was just talking about, which says, what does it mean exactly if the Republicans take back the House? And I guess I would add to that, what good is it if they lose the Senate, the conservatives lose the Senate? But uh, I'll let you I'll let you pontificate on this here. Well, there's a, a fundraiser coming up this week uh, for the Repul- sponsored by the uh, GOP, the Alaska GOP, and the title of it is uh, "Take Back the State House." It's a fundraiser for House candidates, Republican House candidates, and 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 trying to generate a lot of a lot of uh, enthusiasm and activity for the Republicans taking back the House. And so I started thinking about what does that actually mean if the Republicans uh, take back the House? Now, some people. Uh, uh, when I talked to, you know, some people around, uh, the response was, oh, well, it means we get the PFD. Well, it doesn't. Um, and so I, so that led me down the road of, of trying to figure out what it really does mean. You've got Republican candidates. I mean, let's be, let's be direct here. You've got Republican candidates out there who will not, who, who will oppose taxes, uh, even if they are necessary to save the PFD. That they will cut the PFD first and will not and will not uh, not vote for taxes. Uh, Dan Sadler is a is a great example of that. Dan Sadler leads in that district uh, leads in the in the district he's running for election in, um, and uh, over Sharon Jackson and and has and has said uh, and I think he's got it on his website, but at least has said that uh, that he would oppose taxes even if they're necessary to uh, uh, to save the PFD. So you've got you've got Republicans out there who are clearly saying that that uh, they won't vote for the they won't vote to to save the PF they won't take the steps necessary to save the PFD. That's going to look a lot. So the so the House is going to look a lot when you when you get through all that that division and and who's elected. The House is going to look a lot like the Senate has this last year. You're going to have a portion of them who are committed to saving the PFD. We'll try to cut spending, but if it's spending cuts aren't sufficient, like Mike Shower said at, at, at points in, these, in this last session, if spending cuts aren't sufficient, then we need to look at taxes as a substitute for using PFD cuts uh, for revenues. You're going to have a portion of them willing to do that. And then you're going to have a portion of them not willing to do that, who, who are you know, top 20 percenters or top 20 percent defenders and who are, who are saying, no, we're not going to do taxes ever, even though taxes are better for middle and lower income Alaska families, 80% of Alaska families. We're not going to do taxes ever. We will oppose taxes. So you're going to have that split uh, in the Alaska House, just like uh, you've had it in the Alaska Senate. What it probably means at the margin is some resistance to spending, uh, uh, more resistance to spending than what you had 
than certainly what you've had with the with the coalition. So you probably have some reduced uh, uh, support for spending in the House, but you're not going to. You don't have 16. I mean, looking at the at the at the numbers, you don't have 16 uh, like Governor Dunleavy needed wanted uh, in uh, 2019 when he tried to cut. Uh, spending down to the levels necessary to save the PFD. You're not going to have 16 to back up the governor, even if the governor tried it. Dunleavy hasn't talked about that again. He's unlikely to do it. He's certainly not talking about it during this campaign. Um, so even if the governor tried it, you're not going to have 16 to back up the governor on spending. So you're not going to get to PFD cuts through, uh, through spending reductions, even if the Republicans take back the House. So what you've got, I think, at best, if the Republicans take back the House, is a marginal impact on spending, maybe. Not a big impact on spending, a marginal impact on spending, maybe. And you've got, you, you've got as a result of that, you've got some increase in the PFD, maybe, marginal increase in the PFD, maybe. But you don't have enough Republicans to get in there and uh, and protect the PFD, do what it's necessary to uh, to protect the PFD. So I think we end up uh, in the same place, even if the Republicans take back the House. I think I think we're we're heading toward looking like what we just went through on the Senate, which is which is a split Republican Party, conservative Republicans doing trying to identify what's necessary to save the PFD, to do what's right for middle and lower income Alaska families, eighty percent of Alaska families. Uh, and then other, and then the remainder of the Republican Party, just like we had in the Senate, moderate, moderate uh, on uh, on government spending cuts, uh, and uh, doing what they need to protect the top twenty percent from contributing to the cost of Alaska government. Right, because we can see exactly how well, as you point out, that this has been working for the Senate. You can see exactly how contentious it's been and exactly what's happened, especially when you have people who are pro-government spend. Republicans in charge of the leadership of the of these areas. And that's more than likely what would happen even, I mean, if you took over, and I'm not saying Kathy Tilton is that way, but overall, you know, you've got LeBon, you've got uh you've got Thompson, you've got Dan Sadler, you've talked about some of these people. It is going will to be, will will step up and or step will up step, in Fairbanks. Yeah, who said he was more than willing to cut the PFD. Um, I mean, you, you've got these Republicans who are very much about protecting government spend uh, in the long run. And I think that uh, all you have to do is look to the, the Senate to see exactly how that worked out. And if, even if the Senate was exactly as it is at this exact moment, it's the, the, the uphill battle. And if it changes, if people like Mike Shower are voted out and if you get a Kathy Geisel or if you get a Kelly Merrick in there, as we're seeing uh, in some of these races that they're ahead. Good luck. I mean, just flat out good luck trying to get any of that stuff fixed. Yeah, I for me, I mean, what it means for me is I'm 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 not going to look at party. I'm not going to look at, you know, I don't. I, I don't. I don't think taking back the House for the Republicans is 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 an important thing for me. What's What's important for me is finding candidates who will support the PFD, will support middle and lower income Alaska families across the aisle, whether they're on the Republican side or the Democrat side, and will do the necessary things in order to in order to protect uh, in order to protect the PFD. And I think that's I think that's the lesson, frankly, as you as you think about what it means for Republicans to take back, take back the House and what you think about, you know, what 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 candidates, what happens then if Republicans do take back the House? I think it's a uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a positive thing uh, for Alaska. As I say, it will have a marginal may have a marginal impact on spending marginal. I'm not talking about huge dollars here. I'm talking about, you know, sort of symbolic uh, chips here and there along the way. Um, marginal impact on spending, uh, maybe things like uh, 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 defined benefit con- defined benefit plans uh, don't proceed if the Republicans are in control of the House, but they're probably not going to get through the, the Senate anyway. So it's um, I, I just I just see very marginal a very marginal effect. I don't see that sort of attitude getting the PFD restored. So uh, I think there's I think we need to I need to think be thinking about. The House elections a different way 
than simply the mantra of uh, the Republicans take back the House in order to focus right. on uh, getting the PFD protected. Well, I'm getting to the point now, again, with all this stuff and what we were just talking about with the Senate Leadership Committee and all that kind of stuff is why are we supporting the party at all? We should be looking at each individual candidate, and I don't give a crap what their label is. Where do they stand? Are they pro-PFD? Are they smaller government? Um I just don't care. I think, you know, the party system is obviously broken uh, across the nation. And in Alaska, we've got our own brand of infighting inside the party that's just made it basically uh, useless at this point. You should, Like you said, I don't care about the majorities or the leadership or this or that. I want to look at individual candidates. And I'm, I'll am i be honest, I'm I, 20 bucks. Everybody should be dropping 20 bucks in a hat for whatever candidate they think is a good candidate. Uh, and if everybody who listened to this program did that, we'd have a lot more folks that were ready to uh, to go in there and fight for us. But instead, you know, we love to we love to gripe. We love to we love to crab about it. And uh, and, you know, this is where we're at. Yeah, I think I think there are some good I mean, some good Republican candidates. Sharon Jackson, I think, is much stronger on the PFD than Dan Sadler in that district. I think uh, I think Ron Gillum is probably stronger on the PFD than, than Jason Ruffridge in the. Uh, in that district, I think there are some good Republican candidates, but but you're exactly they're not going to. I mean, just like just like the the decision on the Senate side to support Massey and uh, Shower equally, um, I think the Republican, the establishment Republicans, the Republicans with money, are going to go in there and support people like Ruffridge and Sandler and Sadler, who have said and Stapp, who who have said, you know, we're not going to we're not going to have taxes, even though it's better for 80 percent of Alaska families. We're not going to have taxes because of because of the impact it would have on our donors. So you're right. I mean, we need to be out there supporting uh, those Republicans, as well as, frankly, those Democrats uh, who care more about 80 percent of Alaska, care more about middle and lower income Alaska families uh, than they do about, you know, things like taxes or things or things that are related to the top 20. Right. I'm so angry. I'm just I, I'm so frustrated by this. Uh, I got this email yesterday and uh, uh I just, I've been trying to, I've been trying to uh, enhance my calm over this, but I'm just, I'm frustrated. This whole thing. I mean, we, we could see what needs to be done, but there's just a group of people out there that believe the government needs all the money at no matter what the, no matter what the cost to, you know, different people and especially to the lower and middle income groups and everything else. And that, you know, we should just business as usual, just shut up and keep going. And uh, I just, <clears throat> Brad, I don't even know what to say at this point. Well, Doug Massey, I mean, come on. Doug Massey has clearly said that that he supports PFD cuts if necessary to pay for government, that he doesn't support using uh, other revenue sources to pay for government. Clearly said he supports PFD cuts. Doug Massey has clearly said he supports a defined benefit plan for, for public safety officers. Uh, clearly uh, an increase uh, on, uh, on the spending side. Um, <laughs> And, and yet the Republican Party gives him $1,000. Um, that's saying a lot. It's saying that the Republican Party doesn't value the PFD as much as they try to lead people to believe. And, and they are tolerant of, indeed supportive of, people who are running to, uh, to increase spending through, uh, at least through the defined benefit plan. So, um, you know, th that, that one contribution, I mean, not to mention Click, not to mention Gary Stevens, not to mention others, but that one contribution uh, tells you all you need to know uh, about it. I mean, the Republicans might say, look, we need Click, we need Stevens, we need Burt in order to maintain the majority, in order to maintain, in order to maintain control of the Senate. And so giving to them is okay because we need to make sure that they win their elections, so we continue to have at least eleven or twelve or thirteen. Wait, I'm, try, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out the justification on Click. The guy has got a seventy-five percent lead, uh, or seventy-five percent. He's got a twenty percent, twenty-five percent lead on Elijah Verhagen, another Republican, uh, and then the Democrat is trailing way in the weeds back in the back. Plus, he'd been censured, and his ca his candidate as challenger had been endorsed. I mean. It, it, this makes no sense whatsoever unless you've got your friends and you're out there patting them on the ass on the way by saying, here's some money for you, sweet lips. Do me proud. Yeah, well, maybe I don't know. I, I, I can't. 
I, I can't rationalize that. But let's go. Let's go back to Shower and Massey, which is which is where where I want to make the point. I, right. May, maybe you can rationalize some of the Republicans on the on the on the on the basis that they want to uh, they want to maintain the majority, and those guys are necessary to maintain the majority. But here you've got Shower and Massey. No, no other people in that no, effectively no other people in that race. You got Shower and Massey. You got one who's a conservative who says cut spending, maintain the PFD. You've got another who says, yeah, on, on spending, let's go to defined benefits. And I'm clearly against the, I'm clearly in favor of cutting the PFD if necessary to, uh, to support uh, spending. No clearer division between positions uh, that, that you can find, between Republicans that you can find. And yet the Republican Party, the Alaska Republican Party gives money to, gives money to Massey. I mean, it's just, so, so tell me again, tell me again, how the Republican Party is not, you know, a top 20% is not a top 20% protecting party. Tell me again why these guys are really trying to get in there and back up the governor on protecting the PFD and maintaining the PFD. You you can't, you can't, that that donation to Massey just obliterates that, that argument entirely. Right. No, I agree. And as uh, Kathy just points out in the chat room too, Ruffridge is also stating that restoring the defined benefits will be a top priority for him. Uh, I mean, we're seeing this all over the place. This, I thought, you know, uh, every time I think that this defined benefits is finally asleep and down in the grave, somebody resurrects it again. And we keep coming back to it. It is, uh, I mean, it is a boondoggle to end all boondoggles. And yet it seems to be a talking point, not for, I mean, the Democrats have always kind of had it there, but now you've got Republicans who are touting it. And I'm just like, have you people not learned from history at all? And, let, and let's be clear. Some people say, oh, well, I'm just in favor of defined benefits for public safety employees. That's, that's, the, that's the camel's nose in the tent. The plan here is to find benefits. I mean, the plan that e even last session, it became clear. The plan is to push defined benefits for public safety. And as that picks up steam, then say, well, we got to do it for teachers too, because you know we got a teacher retention problem. So we got to do it for teachers also. And as that gathers steam, we're going to be right back to where we were under the old tier system with uh, with all of the state employees captured. I mean, because you wouldn't want to leave anybody out if you're going to do teachers and you're going to do public safety employees. I mean, do you not value those other employees out there? We're going to be right back in the in the in the same spot we were before, with the state taking the risk of markets going down and the state taking the risk of uh, of, of underfunding uh, un underfunding the plans going forward. All right, give me a tease here for number two, Brad. We're going to jump into the break a little bit early, but give me a give me a um, uh, a deal here. Well, I think we need to be talking more about the governor's race. I mean, I've talked about it some, but. But you know, I think the, the assumption is that Dunleavy has has is far and away uh, ahead. That it, this is a cakewalk all the way through November, and and we don't really need to worry about the governor's race. If you look at the latest numbers, the Saturday numbers uh, 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 that have come out of Division of Elections, I don't think that's true. Uh, I think uh, I think this is going to be a tough governor's fight. It doesn't look like it because of because Guerra and Walker are dividing essentially the second place votes, the opposition votes between them. But if you look at the numbers that came out Saturday, uh, it's, it's going to be a very, 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 very tight race. I think it's important that Charlie Pierce stay in. I think it's important that Charlie Pierce run, hot, run, run hard. And I'll explain why when we come back from the break. Continuing now, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Number two, uh, uh, the governor's race, the importance of it. Uh, Brad, uh, let's, get, uh, let's get started here. So let's look at the votes. Let's look at the at the uh, division election final votes on the governor's race uh, from Saturday. Uh, they have Dunleavy well ahead, but at forty point four two percent of the vote. They have Guerra and and Walker behind, splitting the vote between them. Uh, Guerra at twenty three point oh seven in second. Walker at twenty two point seven seven, but combined that's forty five. That's forty five percent of the vote. Forty six. Uh, uh, percent of the vote, uh, actually. So Dunleavy has 40 and combined Guerra and Walker have 46. So let's add in Pierce and Grunwald. That gives you another, that gives Dunleavy, and let's assume all the second, the second choice ballots go for, for uh, Pierce and Grunwald go to Dunleavy. So that's 47% of, of the vote. So looking at the top four candidates, looking at their vote split, you've got Dunleavy slash Pierce, 
at 47. You got Garris slash Walker at 46. This is a tight race. This is, I mean, no one, it doesn't look like anybody's going to get to 50% in the first ballot. And so you're going to start counting these second choice ballots. If Gara finishes second, you got to assume that most of the Walker ballot second choices are going to go to Gara. We've got we've got a very tight race uh, going on for governor, and it's going to come down to what the people you know do they mark their second choice ballots? Do we have do we have bullet voters or not? Do do the people mark the second choice ballots? We hope with uh, with uh, Pierce and with uh, Grunwald that. Uh, we people do additional people do come in to vote and they and the second choice ballot is for Dunleavy. And then what happens to people who supported the other candidates? What happens, for example, to the Kirka Hooper uh, 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 voters? Do they come back in the general election uh, and vote for Dunleavy or do they come into the ballot box or come into the voting booth, vote for Shabako because that's likely who they're going to vote for and then not mark the governor's race. And so you don't and so you don't have a vote in the governor's race. Right. Um, it's a very, it's a, it's a very important election and, 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 or a very, it's going to be a very close vote, at least looking at these numbers. And I think that leads me to believe, or leads me to argue that, that, that Pierce and Grunwald need to be very active, uh, during the, during the fall campaign. Why? Because, because I think they will bring people into the voting booth that otherwise aren't going to show up or otherwise aren't going to vote in the governor's race. They're going to come in and vote Chewbacca and then, uh, and then start skipping on down into the legislative races. We need every voter for the, from, from the fiscally conservative side, we need every voter that we can get on our side in the booth to deal with, uh, to deal with what's going to be going on on the other side. A lot of people speculate. I mean, another point for why it's going to be, it's going to be close. Uh, a lot of people have argued that, uh, uh, when the general election comes, the general election voters tend to be more moderate than, than the primary voters. I'm not sure that holds anymore, but if it does, if it does, you're going to have more moderate voters showing up for, uh, 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 Gara and for, and for Walker, which makes that 46%, even, even 46 to 47 against Dunleavy, even narrower, uh, than, uh, than it looks like, uh, coming out of the, the spring results. So it's, this is going to be, this is not a cakewalk. You, you think you think it is when you look at Dunleavy's 40 and you look at Gara and Walker down in the 20s. You think that's where this is headed, but it's not. It's going to be extremely close. And those Pierce voters, those fourth, uh, uh, fourth voters are going to be, uh, fourth place voters are going to be extremely important. Their second choice is going to be extremely important. And getting the voters for the others uh, back in to come back in and vote the, the Kirka Hooper uh, uh, voters in particular, getting them to come back into uh, the, the the voting booth, vote for Chewbacca, and then continue on down and vote in the uh, in the in the governor's race for Dunleavy. Um, I think uh, I think is is going to be critical to the outcome of that election. If that doesn't happen, uh, if the if Pierce doesn't remain active, if he doesn't engage people and bring people in. That otherwise uh, otherwise wouldn't vote uh, if he doesn't uh, uh, generate a lot of support for Dunleavy in the in the second choice ballots. If the Kirka Hooper people go into the ballot box and don't cast a ballot for governor, um, I think I think Dunleavy is going to be in trouble. So it's th- this is a lot tighter race for governor than I think uh, uh, people are giving it credit to credit right now. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. Uh, I guess my main fear is is that a lot of these people that you're talking about who become bullet voters may come in and vote in the Shabaka race. Uh, they may come in and vote on the uh, uh, on the Congress race. Uh, but at the same time, like you said, they're going to try and look at this race or governor and just say, my candidate didn't make it, so screw them all. And at that point... <laughs> You're 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 handing the potential for victory to the other side by not voting at all. I mean, at least make a vote, even if it's just one and done at that point. I'd prefer it to be two. Um, like I said, I mean, I'm endorsing Charlie Pierce, and and I'll be voting for Dunleavy second, and I won't be ranking any of the other guys uh, simply because that's just that's 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 the way I'm going. But if you just go in there and you and you hold your nose and say or don't hold your nose and and vote for somebody, then 
as you said, it's a one point difference right now between Dunleavy and the combined votes of Garrett and Walker. And so who's going to win? Well, it's a one it's a one point difference between Dunleavy and Pierce combined against against exactly. Walker, I'm sorry, against that's what Walker I meant. and Garrett. I mean, Walker and Guerra beat Dunleavy on 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 their own bottom. So those Pierce voters, I, I cannot I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that Charlie stay in the race. I know all these rumors out there, but that Charlie stay in the race and Charlie campaign hard in order to bring voters in that otherwise may not mark uh, may not may not mark in the governor's race, and not only to bring those voters in, but to but to not discourage them maybe, or maybe encourage them to uh, uh, cast their second choice ballots for, uh, for Dunleavy. It's uh, it's frustrating, but this is where we're at. So again, get your folks out there, get them to vote, get things to, uh, you know, get everybody on board because not voting in one of these elections, specifically in the governor's race is going to leave us very, very vulnerable uh, for a potential blue takeover of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, uh, of the governor's office, which in turn will empower more of the pro-government, not only the Democrats will be empowered, but all those pro-government uh, anti-PFD Republicans that are out there, they'll they'll have carte blanche to do whatever the hell that they want to do. And, uh, and we need to be paying attention to that. All right, Brad, um, how exactly is Alaska supposed to pay for itself in this next economy? How are we paying for ourselves going forward? This is uh, your number three. So there's an op-ed in the uh, in the Daily News. Uh, the uh, the title of it is "Alaskans are building a prosperous next economy while our leaders are stuck in the past," and it's a it's a long piece that uh, that criticizes Alaska's reliance on the resource industry. Says we shouldn't be spending money, time, and effort uh, on continuing to develop our resource in- industry because of the because of the negative impacts, at least of oil and gas, on uh, on climate. And as a result, we ought to be focusing on things like renewable energy, uh, local agriculture, kelp and oyster farming, a growing healthcare industry, broadband expansions, uh, and locally owned uh, tourism. That that's the way forward. Those are the way forward uh, in uh, in the next economy, and that's that's where we ought to be spending our, our our time and effort. I have one question about that: How the heck are we supposed to pay for government uh, in uh, in in that economy? Uh, resource uh, resource extraction, uh, the production taxes, the royalty that comes from resource extraction produces a heck of a lot of revenues uh, to this state. Uh, even in down years, even when prices are down, uh, it produces a heck of a lot of revenues uh, to the state. Uh, if we if we let that go away, if we just let that glide off into the sunset and don't continue to, to develop uh, uh, resources, if we don't continue to have those sources of revenues, how are we going to pay, pay for the state? I will tell you what those what what that group says. They they will say the same thing Walker says, which is well, you know, if we just get the the permanent fund to a hundred billion dollars or or a hundred and ten billion dollars or a hundred and twenty billion dollars, we'll live off the revenue. We'll live off the earnings that comes from the permanent fund. Uh, let's see, that means no PFD. The only way to do that is you've got to eliminate the PFD and in, and then shift the entire permanent fund earnings over to uh, over to pay for government. So basically, when 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 this group talks about our next economy that we ought to we ought to slack off on resource development and we ought to just let that fall off into the sunset or fall off into the sea or wherever it's going to fall, uh, and that and we need to focus on renewable energy and agriculture and broadband expansion and all that sort of stuff. That's the focus we ought to give. Basically, they're saying we ought to cut the PFD. We ought to eliminate the PFD and live off, like trust fund babies. We ought to live off. Uh, off the permanent fund earnings, not share any of that with uh, uh, with the residents of the state, uh, and uh, and and continue on uh, as a state uh, state government in that way. And uh, and of course, as we as we look at this, that is the pipe dream. I mean, the pipe dream here. I mean, this was under Walker, right? He wanted to create. Uh, it wasn't a, a it wasn't a a permanent fund anymore. Now it was a. Uh, uh, I've lost the word. Uh, sovereign all... wealth endowment fund. There you go. Sovereign wealth endowment fund. Right. Exactly. That was the thing, because sovereign wealth, we are sovereign, and it's all our. It's the state's money, and we're going to use it. And it was a hundred million, hundred billion, and now it's a hundred and twenty billion because I've seen what's happened uh, in the past. Uh, but that that means that we have lost. We have been disconnected as citizens from any 
effect on the size and scope of government because then we have no skin in the game whatsoever. Yeah, I, I mean it's a it's a it's a continuous cycle, right? They argument they argue that that we need to focus on these industries, renewable energy, and the other industries, um, uh, and and we need government support because that's the next economy. That's where we need to be going. Um, well, how how is government going to support itself if 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 we need to provide government support to our industry? I mean, right? Uh, the oil industry we take we take uh, revenue from the oil industry through production taxes and royalties. If the only industry that we're going to have is industry that needs government support to survive, how the heck are we ever going to are we ever going to make this state go forward? That's the ulti- that's the ultimate of a self licking ice cream cone at that point. Brian asked the question that I was thinking as you were running through that list of uh, of uh, industries that was in the op ed. I mean, broadband. How does broadband produce any kind of? I mean, how does that become a producing uh, a line item for the state at that point? I mean, there's just so many questions. I have so many questions over this. Well, broadband expansions that multiply entrepreneurial potential. So we're all okay. going to establish, we're going to find the next Amazon because we'll have broadband somewhere out in the... Out yeah, in Western Alaska. Exactly. Somebody out in uh, in uh, Chicknick or someplace is going to be able to have their own uh, Amazon warehouse because they can they have broadband or something. Yeah, but we can't tax them <laughs> because then they wouldn't they wouldn't be competitive, and we have to have government support for them through through paying for the broadband in order to establish them uh, uh, in the first place. So it's. None of these, none of these are revenue producing industries. All of these are revenue dependent, government dependent uh, right. industries. Because how do they get, to, how do they get that broadband out there? Government subsidies, billions of dollars in government subsidies to make sure everybody has the high speed, whatever at their home, no matter if they live in a cabin 580 miles away from the nearest landline to whatever. That's what's important. We got to have the government subsidy to make it happen. And Rob Myers, I, I would be quick to point out, yeah, and and we're taking away the capital. When we take away the PFD, we're taking away the, the little private capital that uh, the people might be able to use to, to 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 develop these small business industries. Because we're taking away their private capital, because we're taking away the PFD, all of it's dependent on government, right? It's dependent right. on it's dependent on the sixty plus one getting their favor. To support your particular industry, we've become. Right. I mean, people who say PFDs are socialist. What is more socialist than than a state government than a state that's dependent on government to fund itself and is taking money um, uh, that otherwise is intended to the private sector, private sector through PFDs to do that? I mean, it's just. It's, it's the ultimate definition of socialism. No, I mean, look, th- this is about creating government dependency. That's what this whole thing is. The whole thing is about creating government dependency. That is the socialistic pipe dream of the author of this opinion piece uh, and a lot of other people is that they want everybody to be dependent on government. Now, whether that's in the welfare state and being dependent on the government programs in that regard, or whether it's in the corporate cronyism state where government or where businesses are dependent on the government contracts and government spend, the ideal here is that everybody be dependent on government at one level or another. That's really the bottom line here. And 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 watch this. Walker, we're going to hear in this election campaign, Walker echoing these comments. Oh, we've got to develop our renewable industry, we, renewable energy industry. We've got to develop this. We've got to develop that. How are you going to pay for it, Bill? Well, we've got this permanent fund. We've got these earnings, and we're going to be able to, to do all these things by uh, by doing that. I mean, Walker's the ultimate PFD cut candidate. He won't come out and say it but he's the ultimate PFD cut candidate. Um, I'm, I'm just, I, you know, this is not the day for me today, Brad, because I'm just so frustrated by this whole thing. And like I said, I've been fighting this fight for 20 years and, and I see, you know, we take one step forward and then we take two steps back and we get one good candidate in there for one, one or another office. And they either self-destruct and roll over and wet on themselves as we've seen with the Dunleavy campaign, or they get uh, attacked from within by members of their own party, as we're seeing right now with Mike shower and Sharon Jackson and others. And, you know, at some point, you just got to I mean, it, throw your hands in the air and just walk away and go out and, and do your own thing at some point. I mean, I, it, it's so it's so tempting sometimes just to basically 
you know, give everybody the finger on the way out the door and basically say, you figure it out, sweet lips, I'm done. Uh, because that's uh, kind of where we're at. So, so talk me back off the ledge, Brad. <laughs> Talk me back off the ledge here and tell me what, you know, how we're going to make this work, because that's that's the question. You got two minutes to fix me here. Go ahead. Well, a your your argument essentially leads you out of Alaska because because you got to walk out the door and Terry wants to stay in Alaska. So, yeah, you, you, yeah. you can't you yeah. can't do that. You got that. But, for sure. Yeah. And, and and the other is and this is going to be heresy and I'm going to get a lot of, you know, hate comments as a result of it. But you've got to you've got to think beyond the Republican Party. The Republican Party is there are Repu there are people in the Republican Party that are part of the solution, but there are also people outside the Republican Party that are part of the solution. I know there's a lot probably a lot of support for Matherly on 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 the listening to the program now, but Kawasaki is a much stronger supporter of the PFD than Jim Matherly ever is going to be. Jim Matherly is much closer to Click Bishop and much closer to Steve Thompson, much closer to Bart Lebon than he's ever going to be to, to Mike Shower. And so when you, when you look at these individual races, you need to be looking at not just party, party title, but you need to be looking at uh, uh, their position on the PFD, their position on the private sector, on, on you know, what's important to 80% of Alaska families. I know some people will say, well, Kawasaki will vote for, uh, would, would be supportive of increased spending. Well, you know, we have increased spending now and we're paying for it through PFD cuts. We have people who aren't going to cut the budget. We have Republicans like, like, like Massey who are saying we got to go to defined benefits. We have Republicans who are spending now and, and we're cutting the PFD to pay for it. I would accept uh, the, the equivalent spending on the Democrat side paid for by some other revenue means paid for by taxes as opposed to being paid for by, uh, by PFD cuts. So it's a, um, you got to look, I guess my response to you, Michael, is there are people out there who are taking the right positions. They just don't all have an R behind the name, by the name. And you've got to look beyond that and start picking out individuals in, in these races, individuals in the in individual races uh, to fashion a government that, uh, that works for 80% of Alaska families. That is heretical, but at the same time, I'm not going to say you're wrong. I mean, that's really the bottom line. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say you're wrong. Brad Keithley. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you coming in. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap on another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.